so um, just to start things off, I'm going to pass over to the host of today, Dr. Kim Marie Spence, um, and let her kind of introduce our guest to whom thanks very much for attending today. Um, and I'm going to be muting myself now. Thank you. Thank you, Ali. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to um, a dual session. Um, it's both uh, arts management and cultural policy seminar and also for our lucky students, it's also a research methods class. Uh, we are very fortunate today to host Dr. Francesca Sobande, uh, digital media lecturer from Cardiff University. Um, who will speak on digital research methods and ethics. Uh, Francesca does a lot of work in this space, including most recently her book on the digital lives of black women in, Brit in, in Britain, and also is currently working on a current project, which I hear will soon be a book um, out of Scotland. Uh, and without further ado, I pass it over to our expert for today, Francesca. Thank you very much for inviting me to take part in this session today. And I'm hoping that although I'll be speaking for a while and sharing some slides shortly, that this can be as discussion based as possible. And I'm very much here for any questions that people might have at different points. So today we're thinking about digital research methods and ethics. I'm hoping to cover quite a lot of ground. So it might feel a little bit like a, um, sort of a, a, a big brief sweeping um, tour of different things you can think about when dealing with digital research methods. And I'm gonna start by telling you a little bit more about myself, some of the questions I've been thinking about throughout the years as part of the work that I do. And we'll also be grappling with some of the different ways that the term data is used as part of research and the notion of data is understood. So a bit about me, as you already know, I'm a lecturer in digital media studies. My work includes a number of projects that focus on the media and digital experiences of black women in Britain, as well as work to do with black history and black lives in Scotland, which is a project that involves a mixture of survey based research, dealing with archived material and also intergenerational interviews. But about today. So some of the questions that I'd like you to be reflecting on over the course of today include, how can we study digital culture and the internet to learn about issues concerning identity, ideology and society? So of course, if you're thinking in particular about say arts management or the creative and cultural industries, you can be reflecting on that when we focus on these different themes and questions. So maybe another way to think about this is how can we draw on digital methods to learn more about the creative and cultural industries, experiences of arts management and how people are using digital tools to create and engage with work. Other questions that we will be spending some time on include how does your own social positionality and digital experience influence your approach to this type of research and what ethical issues impact all of this? Now, when we're dealing with research, quite often in formal educational spaces, ethical issues, that's something that's spoken about at a, a relatively early stage of the research design process. So people will typically be asked to submit a research project for ethical consideration and ethical approval and before they go on to then really embark on the work that they're, they're doing. However, for me, it's always important for ethical issues to be considered continuously throughout a research project and not just start, middle and end, but also after the work has finished, after a thesis is written, ethical issues don't disappear because we think about something once or because we receive institutional approval of some form. And um, ethical issues are, are always there and they can change in ways that are impacted by how a project develops and evolves. So other things to think about, how are issues regarding data and digital research shaped by inequalities? In what ways do data collection and data construction processes maintain forms of structural oppression? And where is the human and humanity in data and its analysis? I'll be explaining this in more detail shortly, but here it's maybe helpful for me to emphasize that I use terms such as data construction processes, because for me, the place from which I approach my research, my epistemological point of view, is one that involves thinking about data as something that is constructed. Data is 
the outcome of a process by which a piece of information or an experience or even in an individual becomes viewed as a data point and becomes identified as, as something that a researcher can learn from. So to break that down and, and say that in a simple way as possible without hopefully reducing the complexity of what I'm trying to deal with, to me, data isn't something that already exists out there to be collected and analysed. Um, data is a term used to describe the result of research processes that involve individuals, places, experiences becoming regarded as data. This term or this last point here, where is the human or humanity in data? I'll be speaking about that to really get you to reflect on the different ways that individuals as part of research, as researchers and as people who might be researched and the different ways their humanity is or is not respected. The extent to which the fullness of who they are is acknowledged as part of research or might be overlooked, obscured and um, disregarded and degraded even. So digital research, what is it? There are so many different explanations out there. So all of what I say today is informed by my own experiences and there are many people who will offer different points of view, but digital research can involve researching the internet and digital culture. Although when we're dealing with digital methods, that doesn't mean we're necessarily solely focusing on questions to do with the digital or, or the internet. But digital research can involve analyzing digital content, artifacts, archives, behavior, as well as discussions and self-representations of people that involve digital technology in some way. How can we understand people, politics, places, power and processes with the use of digital research methods? And these words, people, politics, places, power and processes, are words and concepts really that are, are very applicable to a whole host of different disciplines, different areas of study. So it might be if you're focusing on the arts and the creative and cultural industries, you think about um, the politics that, that shapes a particular space or sector. You think about how the geocultural context that creative work is situated when, within is impacting the sort of creative work that is produced or the sort of creative work that's most likely to be funded and supported in a sustainable way. What challenges and opportunities can be involved in digital methodological approaches? We'll be touching on some of this. And here I just wanted to highlight a really helpful resource in case you're not familiar with it, which is the Internet Research Ethical Guidelines available through the Association of Internet Researchers website. When we're dealing with digital methods, there are lots of different ethical issues that inevitably will come up. And something that students will often speak to me about is the fact that depending on what they read, and one place advises them that because something is publicly available, they can freely analyze it as a researcher. Another place says just because something is available in the public domain doesn't mean that somebody has provided a researcher with consent to analyze what is publicly available as part of a, a research project. And so what we're dealing with can be very great areas. Um, a lot of these ethical questions involve thinking very carefully about the sorts of values that underpin the research you're doing and the sort of values that are at the heart of who you are as a researcher. So there are lots of different theories, lots of different frameworks that you can draw on when making use of digital methods. This is by no means an exhaustive list, but this is me just highlighting some of the different areas or spaces that have influenced my work over the years. So this could be theories, studies, literature that connect to social identity, thinking about performativity, looking at symbolic interactionism, the notion of working identity, how identities and the way they are expressed can differ across various environments. Audience and spectator theory can be helpful. For me, I'm located in the School of Journalism, Media and Culture at Cardiff University, and the work of Stuart Hall has played a huge part in my thinking on everything that I do as a researcher, including Hall's work to do with encoding and decoding messages. And it might be that you're doing research that involves grappling with difficult questions to do with media framing, to do with spectacle. Perhaps gender feminist and queer theory is really relevant to the work that you're doing. Maybe cyber feminism is going to help you to understand the specific way that um, arts is developing in a certain place. There's really great literature on queering the internet, thinking about questions to do with sexuality and different digital spaces. Perhaps Marxist and class politics theory would be useful, critiques of capitalism, power and class structures. Theories to do with globalization, so that could be analysis of global powers, different hierarchies, Anglocentrism, notions of nation. 
or for me, a lot of my work really is, um, you know, located within the Black digital studies space. So the work, for example, of Kishana Gray on Black cyber feminism and Andre Brock on digital blackness. So digital discourse is a term I'm going to spend a little bit of time thinking about right now. It might be a term that's very familiar to you. And just in case it isn't, I was going to offer a very brief overview of how I tend to regard what digital discourse is. So when we are working with discourse and when we're analysing discourse, we, you could argue, are dealing with repeated and ongoing discussion, communication, public dialogue and debate about specific topics, themes and issues. So this, these different forms, these different examples of discourse can uphold and or challenge different sociopolitical positions, perspectives, power dynamics and institutions. Now, to move from discourse to digital discourse, you could say we're now dealing with discourse that is constructed and communicated through and across various digital spaces and platforms. So this can include, but it's not limited to written, visual and audio forms of communication. So it might be that the work you're doing involves a digital discourse analysis of people's perspective of a, a, a recent piece of art. It might be that you do a deep dive of digital discourse that somehow conveys the different experiences people have working within uh, a certain um, role or working within a certain arts organisation. Now, digital discourse and an interest in it can really link to lots of different topics, lots of different research areas. And these are just a few issues or aspects of digital culture that you could spend some time really getting to grips with when doing research that involves strong and digital methods. So you might be interested in how people communicate with brands, or you might be interested in how people become self brands. You could do work that focuses on viral content and the role of viral content and digital discourse in the creative and cultural industries. This could also mean that you end up spending some time looking at hashtags and trending topics. Perhaps you're analyzing propaganda or focusing on issues to do with ownership and credit how credit is or isn't um, you know, attributed to people in terms of the creative work that they do. The political underpinnings of everything that's going on might be a part of the work that you do. And I'm always fascinated by questions to do with visibility or invisibility and opacity. So it might be that you decide you are interested in different examples of digital content or digital art and digital communities that aren't necessarily as visible as those that tend to be foregrounded in the, the mainstream of that creative space. Other points here, the digital presence of celebrities and online influencers. I've had great conversations with people over the years about um, sort of you know, artists and influencers, those blurred boundaries, when an individual is both at once, when an individual perhaps identifies as one rather than the other. And um, you know, there are lots of different things to do with digital culture, the arts and the creative and cultural industries that we could spend a lot of time discussing together. So a few other examples here of just the sorts of prompts you could use to really think about, you know, maybe you don't have a fully formed research project in mind, but you know you want to do something with digital methods and you, you don't know exactly where to start. You could spend some time, you know, reflecting on different digital personas and personalities perhaps focusing on digital identities, ideologies and inequalities. Do you feel that digital media has to an extent democratized media production processes or you know, has democratized different examples of industry activity? Some people will make claims about the fact that the rise of online content sharing platforms and social media means that individuals can forge a career, um, including perhaps as an artist, without having to navigate some of the restrictive and traditional aspects of the industry that they would have always had to have deal with in the past and um, have dealt with in the past. Do you think that's the case? What's, what, what, what are your feelings on the relationship between politics, digital media and the arts? And last couple of points here, um, terms such as digital etiquette or this notion of digital in-group activity can be a useful one if we're thinking about the politics of forms of interaction, social communication, community, and the different ways that norms and ideals are conveyed in digital spaces and can tell something about the people who take part in them. DIY culture, that was another point in that previous slide, um, do it yourself or do it together, DIY digital culture and, and the arts, there's lots of scope to focus on stuff there. 
So starting to move on from thinking about digital discourse and to just give you a few more po points on this before I move on to think about other aspects of digital research methods and ethics. Digital discourse analysis can involve exploring the interconnectedness, meaning making and ideological dimensions of online commentary. It can involve interpretivist approaches as well as positivist approaches. So this might be an interpretive analysis of qualitative and visual content, um, but you could also have a more positivist oriented approach whereby someone is working with a lot of quantitative digital data. Now, the work that I do has included research that relates to digital remix culture, which is a term that I use when I'm focusing on forms of media and digital activity that involve the remixing, repurposing of existing media material to produce something that communicates a, a certain meaning or message um, or point of view. So here I wanted to offer some explanations that I've used when working with memes, thinking about memes as a researcher, and also always being aware of the fact that meme culture is so rapidly changing that these explanations that I was you know, focusing on in 2019, the limitations of them to me are, are always clear and what people come to know as, as what constitutes a meme has moved on since then. That said, you could say that an online meme is content assembled by users from photographs, videos, visuals, and text. Memes are commonly humorous and incorporate cultural references, which make them relatable in ways that can conjure a sense of intimacy. Memes are a source of entertainment and digital participatory community in-jokes, which can seamlessly bridge the perceived gap between politics and popular culture. Memes may express both the views of individual internet users and a culture's collective sentiments, offering a glimpse into the public's psyche. This slide is really a way for me to focus on a couple of examples that are connected to meme culture and meaning making. And here I was really trying to think, you know, when we're dealing with memes, we are always dealing with an audience, potentially a creator, a producer. And memes, they can commonly be humorous, although they can be you know, very dark, incorporate cultural references. And as I've already said, they can conjure a sense of intimacy and relatability. So just as with adverts, which can invoke culturally specific cues to target audiences, and um, memes can involve this too. And when looking at these two memes, I found myself thinking about the question of who's the imagined or implied lecturer here? What traits seem to be attributed to them? And how is this communicated? And one of the many discussions I'll have with students when teaching a module that I developed to do with memes, digital remix culture and um, online experiences is whether or not memes are ever just a bit of fun, whether or not memes are ever just for laughs. And as always, everything is open to interpretation, but we really try to think about the fact that the politics of memes and digital culture we're not only just speaking about times when people will intentionally create memes to communicate a very explicit political point of view or to contribute to political campaigning, we're also talking about the politics that shapes who does or doesn't have access to the resources to make memes in the first place and um, whose memes are most likely to be responded to in certain ways. So essentially what I'm saying here is even when we're dealing with something that's incredibly funny and there's a lot of humour involved, politics will always be in the room in some way or another. So we've thought a bit about digital discourse analysis. We've also thought a bit about memes and meaning making. And hopefully if my slide moves on, and now it has, um, I was just gonna pause and ask people, how would you define what a meme is? And if you spend some time thinking about this, make some notes to yourself. And um, it might be that you're happy to post something um, in the Q and A section that we can pick up later on, but it would just be really useful if you spend a moment right now thinking about how would you define well, how would you define what a meme is, um, and perhaps do you feel as though your understanding of what a meme is has changed in many ways over a period of time? If for whatever reason you're not familiar with what memes are right now, are the explanations I'm offering helpful? Are they um, so ambiguous that it's it's difficult to get a sense of what on earth a meme is? And I would also say um, on that note, I think the ambiguity that can be a part of thinking about and working with memes is, is a part of this broader space of digital remix culture we're dealing with, where things are constantly changing, constantly evolving and are, are shifting in sometimes innovative and exciting ways. 
So the meanings associated with online content constantly change, as I've just said, they are also often challenged. So we see things being remixed, remade. We see uh, an initial piece of media um, be recontextualized and decontextualized across different platforms, different places, and become associated with so much more than perhaps it was initially intended to be. The meanings that are connected to that content are also shaped by the context within which it was originally created and where and how it's engaged with. So while speaking with students about this, we've often had discussions to do with when a screenshot of social media content from one platform ends up on another platform and how the sort of discourse that surrounds that is impacted by the platform it started out on, as well as the platform it then moves to, and these sort of norms or these very narrow notions of social media etiquette that might be attached to, to these different platforms and digital culture. So what words come to mind when you're thinking about memes and digital remix culture? For me, this includes belonging, speed, viral, sharing, affirming, in-joke, cultural codes, communication, politics, cultural values, and marketing. A couple of links here now to websites that could be useful for you. Um, know Your Memes is a database that provides information to do with the origins and history of memes. But I'd always caution people to just remember that you know, there's the potential with memes and even writing about their origins and um, for there, there to be forms of misrepresentation and reframing. So it, it can be difficult when we're dealing with digital artifacts and digital archives to really be able to determine um, the, the origins of exactly what it is we're focusing on. Another link here is to the Wayback Machine, which is an internet archive that provides information uh, and visuals that relate to different websites across different years. So for somebody who is maybe interested in seeing how a brand has changed their digital image, this could be a really great place to turn to in terms of using digital methods and looking at how organizations change over time. So we've covered hopefully um, a, a fair amount at this point. Um, always one for, for sort of throwing out questions for people to consider. So here I would just say spend a moment or two thinking about what DIY digital media is. What does that mean to you? How is it implicated in people's lives? How does use of the internet reflect societal power dynamics? How are global relations connected to digital experiences, including research? Now that we've had uh, a good amount of time to sort of you know, touch on various elements of doing research, of doing digital research and, and focusing on digital culture, I'm going to provide some more specific examples of different approaches, different methods, before then really going through my thoughts on data and, and what it means to think critically about data and the ethical implications of that. So here, one of many different ways that people can make use of digital methods um, includes when doing a ethnographic piece of work. So this quote, rooted to core ethnographic principles of participant observation, while also seeking to selectively and systematically incorporate digital approaches, such as social network analysis, data science and analytics, visualization methods, social media research presence, and videography. So these words of cause and that's to do with netnography. Um, hopefully, if you aren't already familiar with, with netnographic work, give you a, a sense of some of what it can entail. And here it's good for us to connect back to some of what I spoke about earlier on to do with ethical questions and digital material that is publicly available. And for me, I think what's helpful to always remember is that just because something is publicly available and um, just because something is in the, 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 the public domain um, and just because in some cases that means you might have a, a legal right to engage with it as a researcher, um, or it certainly wouldn't be illegal for you to do so, doesn't mean that the person who's created or posted that material has provided consent um, for you to analyze it. And I guess why I keep coming back to this is sometimes, particularly in institutional contexts, research ethics are sometimes solely equated with what is or isn't legal, what is or isn't um, legally dubious. But when we're dealing with ethics and we're dealing with values, it, it's a lot deeper than that. So just because you might have a, a right to access something or you are able to access something um, and, and you won't face any repercussions in terms of, of accessing it because 
you're able to, it's publicly available. And um, it, it doesn't necessarily mean that engaging with that material will be, as a researcher, the, the ethical thing to do. So there are other questions that come to mind. Will your engagement with that material potentially result in harm being inflicted on somebody? Might you end up analysing a tweet as part of a project you're working on and making the identity of the person who posted that tweet clear in a way that brings a lot of unwanted attention um, to somebody and renders them hyper visible in a way that could result in online abuse and harassment. So just because something's publicly available to really reiterate this point doesn't mean that the person who has created or posted what is publicly available um, is necessarily happy with that material being analysed as part of research. So when you're faced with that question, other questions come up. Are you going to try and obtain consent from that person? Um, if not, how are you going to engage with that material in a way that involves being mindful of those ethical considerations? Might you paraphrase? Might you analyse material without making clear who had produced it and created it? If you do take that approach, are you then analysing material without crediting somebody who would like to be credited? Um, there aren't easy answers to all of these questions, but I think the key point I'm making here is that these ethical considerations need to be dealt with with care and continuously throughout a research project. So another specific approach that can be really helpful when doing research that involves digital research methods is critical technocultural discourse analysis. And this was developed um, by Andre Brock, and there's excellent work out there by Brock, which outlines how to approach critical technocultural discourse analysis, but also makes clear that there, there isn't this prescriptive one way, and um, you know, there's scope for interpretation, but there are some very core principles that should be at, at the center of that. So this explanation from Brock essentially states a multimodal analytic technique, that's CTDA, critical technocultural discourse analysis, um, for the investigation of internet and digital phenomena, artifacts and culture. It integrates an analysis of the technological artifact and user discourse framed by cultural theory to unpack semiotic and material connections between form, function, belief and meaning of information and communication technologies. And here I'd add, I believe there's a really brilliant looking workshop that Brock's running online over the coming weeks on critical, dis critical technocultural discourse analysis. So I can share the, the link to that in case it's helpful for anyone. A few other points here on CTDA and what it's meant to involve. It can involve evaluating technologies as an assemblage of artifacts, practices and cultural beliefs, as I've just spoken about there. And I think it's useful to really emphasise these terms, artifacts, practices and cultural beliefs, to make clear that such an approach um, is, is so deeply connected to questions to do with culture, questions to do with society, questions to do with knowledge as well. So what does or doesn't come to be understood as a digital artifact, as a digital practice or a cultural belief? A CTDA analysis examines how actors shape technologies and themselves in response to the technologies they use. And these technologies in turn are shaped by those who design and market them. So it's really dealing with the relationship between technology, between people, between society um, and, and thinking, you know, not just about people as, as this big, um, group of, of non-identifiable individuals, but specific groups within that. So who's making the tech? Who's interacting with the tech? And um, who's producing the, the, the imagery that might be analysed? Who is contributing to the discourse that the researcher is dealing with? And who is all of that impacting and how? So this means that you might find yourself spending a moment or two really thinking about who is this research um, related to or who are the different people involved in the digital research project I have planned or the digital research project that I'm working on. There are lots of different words that are used by researchers to describe those involved in their research and you know when especially focusing on media um, and cultural studies some of the terms that come up include producers, creators, spectators, consumers and then we have sort of a combination of words prosumer, the, the person who's both produce, producing and um, perhaps consuming, um, or producers, again, thinking about how social media and digital technology means that many people are simultaneously producing and using. 
And this is just a handful of different words, but I do think that as researchers, choices to do with words can actually have a huge impact on how the project itself is framed and how people are understood. And um, especially when we know that people's ind individual experiences can become viewed as data. So the difference between being referred to as say, a producer, a, a user, a, a participant or respondent um, can be quite considerable in terms of what it suggests about power dynamics, both between the researcher and who their, their work connects to, and also power dynamics between individuals who are involved in media production and media engagement experiences. So these are a few activities that you could do in your own time. And um, what was one of the last memes or gifts that you encountered? Why was it memorable? What did it mean to you and, and why? If there aren't any, I would maybe just say, what was one of the last images that you encountered? Why is it memorable? What did it mean to you and why? And in what way was that image connected to digital technology or digital culture? Do you think that digital remix culture and meme culture is more influential in political campaigning and democracy than mainstream media and marketing? Um, a lot of my teaching involves really debates and discussions to do with this concept of DIY digital culture and then the concept of a more mainstream um, mass media and more mainstream forms of communication. And the fact that sometimes distinguishing between those can be very difficult. Is distinguishing between them even helpful at this point, you could say? Last thing here, how would you describe a meme? So I posed that question earlier on, just you know, what do memes mean to you? But you could have a go at writing one sentence five words, two words, one word. And then it's really interesting to reflect on, well, what key components of a meme seem to um, come to the foreground for you when you're thinking critically about them. Another activity that could be useful, identify and analyze two memes, what messages are conveyed via the meme or via the, the, the memes individually and collectively. How and why do you think this? What context is the meme located in, including online context and the wider socio-political context that it's part of? What emotions and audiences might you associate with this meme and why? How do these memes compare to each other? And do these memes relate to particular cultural references? If so, which ones? So all of this research, digital methods, ethical issues, it really means that we are dealing with social matters, we're dealing with personal matters, and we're dealing with political ones. And four words that can be beneficial to come back to when approaching research are community, connections, care, and commitments. What communities are you a part of? And not just sort of researcher communities, but community in the broader sense. And um, what communities um, might benefit from your, your work or which communities might actually be harmed by it? What connections do you feel between yourself, your own experiences and the work that you're doing? How is a sense of care and ethics of care a, a part of your approach to the research? And what commitments have you made as a researcher um, to the different people involved in your work and perhaps to yourself as well as others? So digital research methods can involve work that is about different communities, different digital communities, and that means that thinking about community is gonna be essential to, to work such as that. Community is more than just about identity. And um, you could say that community can concern a group of people connected in ways related to who they are. For example, where they're located or shared understandings, ideas, experiences, responsibilities, values, and efforts. Um, but community is it's not just about how many people are part of it. It's about how people come together in ways that involve connections and kinship rooted in a shared location and not necessarily in a geographical sense, especially when we're dealing with digital, but that could be part of it um, or a shared sense of situatedness. So if you're doing work that involves you know, digital communities, how do you define community as part of that? And how does the digital then possibly trouble the way that community is understood or conceptualized? Community is more than marketing or hashtag. Community isn't something that can be manufactured. It merges in ways shaped by factors such as geography, mutual respect, material conditions, and collective goals. So community is more than myth. You could say it's every day. It's both ordinary and extraordinary. It's a part of people's daily interactions and activities. And I think because of this, sometimes researchers um, are, are able to get a sense of some of what is going on in, in different digital 
communities by going online and sort of the everydayness of digital communities um, can be quite visible to researchers. But as always, another question comes up that, you know, does that mean that just because there's some degree of visibility surrounding a digital community, that it is helpful um, for a researcher to be engaging with that digital community as part of the research that they do? What are the ethical implications? So digital community is about more than just unity. And, um, you know, as I said, it could be people who are connected in ways related to who they are, but who also embrace differences as well as shared goals and experiences. Communities impacted by places, politics, and the possibilities presented by working and living in collective ways, rather than adopting individualistic approaches. And I think this focus on collectiveness can also be very helpful um, and important for, for researchers. Unfortunately, I think a lot of research cultures and, and academia can be quite individualistic um, in terms of its orientation, and that has real, a real impact on ethical considerations. So how can you be thinking about community and collectiveness as part of the work that you do as a researcher, and ensuring that those questions to do with community and collectiveness move beyond your immediate um, academic or educational or research-based space? So finally, um, I want to leave a good amount of time for some questions if anybody has any, but I wanted to speak a bit about data. What is data? How is it created, constructed, or you might be somebody who feels as though it exists out there to be collected? And um, what isn't data? Is data more than information? In what ways do ideas about and experiences of race and racism impact understandings and the analysis of data? Where's the human or humanity in data? So how are people treated um, with respect or how are they objectified and degraded as part of research processes that involve data? How does the commercialization of data relate to matters regarding intersecting inequalities? So here I'm just going to offer a few brief responses and one's a personal anecdote. A number of years ago, I was on a, a train back from work and my ticket fell out of my pocket at some point during that journey. And when I got to the train station, I was stopped and I wasn't allowed to go through the train barriers because I didn't have my ticket on me. And I noticed the person who stopped me, um, who, who worked um, for the, the, you know, the, the rail service, had an electronic device and was making a note of information about me um, to store as data. Now, at no point was I asked questions to do with things such as my age, my race, my gender, my ethnicity, but I could see that information being noted down. And that example brings up a lot of questions to do with ethics and um, a lot of questions to do with what it means when someone tries to describe or categorize a person without actually finding out who they are, how they self-identify, how they self-define. Um, to what extent was I being regarded as a person, as, 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 as um, sort of a human in that moment, as opposed to uh, a moment in time that was becoming some form of data creation, some form of data capturing. And questions to do with commercialization are important here because we know there are so many commercial organizations um, that are, are looking for data um, to, to continue to uphold and put forward some very horrific and oppressive practices in society that are informed by structural inequalities, including but not limited to racism, sexism, ableism and classism. So data, what becomes data, how it is used can have hu a huge impact on society. And that means for researchers, there are a lot of questions to do with ethics and data that need to be carefully considered. Data is never neutral. It's never disconnected from the realities of racism and interconnected inequalities. It's always political and politicized, you could say. So for me, even the claim that something is objective is a political statement in itself. It's, it's based on some notion of what is or isn't um, allegedly objective. And it's often based on some values that are ascribed to the notion of objectivity as opposed to subjectivity. Think about editorialized narratives and storytelling related to data. So sometimes people will say the data speaks for itself. I would always argue with that. The data doesn't speak for itself. And you could have the same piece of what is referred to as data that features in a lot of different context, a lot of different writing sits alongside it, and suddenly it takes on different meanings. It's not the data itself that would be skewed, but there's narrativizing, there's editorializing, there's storytelling that occurs as part of um, research that involves data. And if we accept that data is never neutral, what does that mean for our use of or rejection of terms such as objective and valid? Now here I'm not saying we can never look at something and um, you know, take seriously sort of the factual nature of what's being put forward. 
I'm really trying to get people to think about the power relations involved in research, questions to do with knowledge, and the different ways objectivity is often framed as something that is desirable, something that is valuable, and subjectivity is often dismissed and sort of positioned um, in opposition to it. So I've spoken already about the commercial side of data. Here I just say we've seen the rise of the business of equality, diversity and inclusion data. And um, so sort of this, this industry that surrounds data that is often held up as a way for organizations to try and say they're inclusive, organizations who are trying to position themselves as addressing inequality, but sometimes their data collection process or I would say their data construction process actually involves um, so some different moments that are upholding the very forms of inequality that they're claiming to push against, including, for example, not providing people with the chance to define themselves in the way that they do, um, or you could say aggregating data in ways that obscure distinct differences between people who are referred to using one sort of essentializing, homogenizing category. Inequalities aren't an abstract concept. So racism, sexism, ageism, ableism, homophobia, transphobia, colorism, Islamophobia and interconnected inequalities impact people's lives, including their material conditions and treatment in society. Inequalities are built into the foundations of many structures and organizations. So the work to address them must be robust and sustained, including at the research design stage for a researcher. I say all research is connected to the social and the political. And because of that, questions to do with the potential for research to um, push against or contribute to harm should continually be explored by researchers. Now, data bias is a term that has circulated in many different research spaces. And here, I just want to share a few thoughts on this. Um, I'm not even sure that bias is the most helpful way to, to discuss some of what we're dealing with here, because sometimes these issues reflect intentional decisions that are made and that do uphold inequalities and, and power dynamics. But what we're focusing on here are structural inequalities that can manifest in the data creation or construction, or some might say collection process and the analysis process as well. We can see there are times when there are unexamined or obscured um, aspects of what is defined as data. And um, so what I mean by that is sometimes research is held up as objective and universal, when actually if, if we dig deeper, we see there are parts of, of the, the data that is being dealt with that suggests there's something very different going on and how on earth can this particular research project claim to speak for so many people or for all. So there's a wide range of biases that exist, which means it's vital to name specific biases and intersecting oppressions. Again, here I'd say the term bias is one that I don't personally tend to find particularly helpful. And um, I know that different people are approaching research from various spaces, and it might be that the language of bias is more familiar than some of the other terms that I'm making use of today. This all also relates to who in society tends to be treated as the norm that is taken into consideration and prioritized, and who tends to be othered, and forms of cherry picking that can provide an incomplete picture um, of research and that can serve a particular political purpose. So when people are framing data in such a way, they are highlighting certain parts of it in order to push a, a certain message, a certain narrative, um, and ultimately skew what the data um, is, is apparently revealing or suggesting. So coming towards the end of these slides, oftentimes I will have long discussions with people about, you know, what is the difference between something that's anecdotal and something that's data? And I would often see the difference, it comes down to power relations, it comes down to politics, it comes down to forms of um, institutional legitimization, forms of um, sort of authentication that connect to receiving some sort of institutional approval. And I know people have a lot of different opinions about this, but myself and a friend and Chris Osai did a, a paper thinking about um, our projects to do with different black digital experiences and reflecting on the notion of objectivity and how it's often based upon white Eurocentric and masculinist conceptualizations of knowledge production, which can be very dismissive of knowledge anchored in the lived experiences of black people and different marginalized groups, and can uphold an assumed irreconcilable distinction between what is referred to as data and knowledge and what is referred to as anecdotal. So I'd ask people to ask themselves, um, you know, what is the difference between anecdote and data and um, beyond often these processes that I've been thinking about today, these processes whereby an institution um, gives something the stamp of approval or doesn't, and often for reasons 
you could say that are informed by some of the inequalities that I have mentioned. Finally, if you're especially interested in digital feminist ethnographic work, you could approach a digital project uh, with some various feminist underpinnings. You'd want to be clear on the sort of feminist work that has informed that. You'd want to really explain what is the digital being explored and how is it experienced by different people in different ways. You might want to focus on how an ethics of care is upheld and communicated. And how does your positionality inform your work and how do you account for this throughout the work? Are you engaging in research or reflexivity? If so, in what sort of way? What do you want this research to do? Who is it for and why? Digital publics are part of all of this. And I probably don't need to say again at this point, just because something's public doesn't mean that there are no ethical issues involved with engaging with that as a researcher, anything but that. And this was just me thinking of a specific example that could connect to all of this. And this was thinking about long COVID and how we've seen so many people who have experienced this contributing such insightful and meaningful um, you know, discussion and knowledge online, it's sort of patient-led digital discourse, community-led digital discourse that has you know, really furthered understandings of these experiences and has also pushed against times when people have been dismissive of the realities of those who are dealing with long COVID. I would say this is something people are interested in as researchers, lots of ethical questions, of course, um, including whether or not this is something you've experienced yourself, what it would mean to engage with these communities and to ensure that if you were doing that and um, you respected the, the community led nature of all that's been happening. Lastly, personal introspection and accountability. So this is all to do with research or reflexivity again. Who are you and how does that inform the work that you do, your research interests, the way that you approach it, how you define knowledge, um, whose scholarship and whose work has really shaped yours. How will you should hold yourself accountable when doing this work? How will you engage with um, or who will you engage with and support as part of this work? And how will you engage with them too? How will you identify and address ethical issues in the process? Which communities are you part of? And how might this shape your research? Thank you very much for inviting me um, to the session today. And I'm looking forward to any questions or comments that people would like to share. Thank you so much, Francesca. Yeah, I, kn I know in the digital world, we don't get the applause. Thank you. Um, I know I uh, I'll await Ali to come up with any questions or actually guys, this is the time to put up some questions. One student did um, did try uh, 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 an, an definition of memes. So image with short message people can relate to which, relate to which provides an idea with a sense of humor. Mm -hmm. Uh -huh. So I guess in lieu of other questions, and please put in the in the Q and A, guys. Um, I wanted to tap into more of. You gave the example of the collection of your information. I wanted to tap into what's an example in your research so where the idea of public of the, who the public is has forced you to pull back from an original work idea so mm -hmm. where it, it basically where it fails because i find those are the areas in which we you learn more mm -hmm. than when you're great and mm -hmm. successful yeah so i think um i mean correct me if i'm wrong so the questions around you know the idea of the digital public and times when actually is almost times when that concept doesn't necessarily capture what's going on Yes. yes. And, and, and where, where you've had to yes. do your own change in terms of what you intended to do versus yes. what you were allowed to do. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thank you. So I think maybe two things come to mind. One is that sometimes when we're speaking about the digital, digital research, digital media, digital methods, there can be such an emphasis on what is um, visible in different ways, what feels or, or is viewed as being public, like you said. And actually, I didn't mention this at the start, but it's maybe helpful for me to share now. And when I did my PhD, which became my book on the digital lives of black women in Britain, the main research method I made use of was in-depth semi-structured interviews. So actually, I really wanted to speak to people and I really mm. wanted to know in their own words, what have your media experiences and eventually in particular, what are your digital media experiences like? How did they feel? What thoughts do you have about them? And 
what was really helpful as part of all of that was realizing there were so many aspects of people's experience of the internet, digital platforms, digital spaces that weren't necessarily visible or, or public to people, um, but were important to understand and were really critical to how they were how would they were dealing with their daily lives. And what I mean by that is I think there's a difference between what might not be publicly available and what might not be visible and what people are comfortable sharing, for example, in the context of those research interviews, and then other things that go on, which are things that aren't public for very specific and very clear reasons, mm -hmm. aren't things that people want to be sharing with researchers, and aren't things that they want researchers to be researching or highlighting in the work that they do. And what I mean by that is there are times when I've been involved in a research project or had a conversation with somebody or interviewed them as part of the work that I'm doing. And I realize that the nature of what they're speaking about is such that, you know, even if you're trying to maintain anonymity or pseudonymity, that could be compromised or the nature of what they're speaking about could result in some sort of a vulnerability on their part um, that, that doesn't seem ethically right at all. So I think there are some times when it comes to whether it's research interviews or whether it is analyzing material online that you really are confronted with the fact that the potential to learn from this is not going to outweigh the potential for it to cause someone his distress and harm yeah, um, yeah. And, and then there are other avenues that can be explored yeah uh, no i can see that I, um particularly i see where i in my k-pop research to poly the politics and ethics around subtweeting. Like I understand the subtweeting, but the point of subtweeting is mm. to not have that information, mm. to have that information anonymous and not get to certain channels. Mm -hmm. So the discussion where mm. you actually have to do the whole with, con well, you have to actually contact and get permission. Mm -hmm. Cause that's mm -hmm. what subtweeting is about. Mm -hmm. It's about camouflage. Mm -hmm. Well, I'd love to. Uh, I'd love to know more about your work. On that. <laughs> like, I mean, that, I, mean so and the, I don't write about it, but it's mm -hmm. the ethical mm -hmm. thing to think. So, but I'll get to the questions. We have one um, from uh, Maria O'Brien. So, how can you future proof your? How how do you future proof your work? And yeah, knowing that you're working on all these developing technologies, Twitter three years ago, and well, Twitter pre-Trump and Twitter after Trump. So how yeah. do you future proof your work? I, I, I was gonna say I don't know I don't know if you can. <laughs> I think it's almost <laughs> I think you know I, I'm just always conscious, especially the way that a lot of research processes and writing and, and publishing processes work by the time something is you know finished because things are always ongoing. So much has changed. So I think it's um, something that I've been enjoying doing more of in recent recent months and years is, you know, revisiting ideas and in, you know acknowledging that my thinking on something has changed or that that platform or that space has changed. So for example, when I started my PhD in 2015 and I was speaking to different black women in Britain about their digital experiences and um, certain platforms or certain digital trends or digital discourses were in a different place then than they were now. Mm -hmm. And I think some of the optimism that some people shared in terms of what felt like maybe a democratizing moment um, has, has definitely changed. There are people I spoke to who are off those platforms now. And I think to bring that back to the question, I think although we can't necessarily future-proof, what we can do is just always be reflexive and conscious of the fact that stuff's changing so quickly. And um, so we need to be um, open to revisiting ideas and open to reflecting on what it means when the technology or the experiences have shifted beyond where we were at um, and yeah, we staying humble, I guess, throughout the, throughout the research process. <laughs> true, true. Um, we have okay. So I hope that that works, Maria. Please feel free to do any follow ups in the chat. Um, uh, Margaret White, one of our students, asked. So, what would you perceive to be the ethical issues concerned with consulting oral histories that are publicly available online in research? She, in particular, is doing a case study on ACT UP, um, a whole lot of official oral history, uh, and it has its own of official oral history project gathered between with interviews gathered between 2002 and 2013. But are there ethical issues with interpreting or misinterpreting once a time has passed? Yeah, that's great. I think I guess there's always there's ethical issues with, with every aspect of this. <laughs> and, and I think it's um maybe some of the ethical issues I'm thinking about is 
you know, where, for example, I'm just going to bring up the question so I can be looking at it, but where, for example, are those oral histories located? So whether mm. that is um, a publication, where is that publication available or not available? Um, you know, is there anything in those oral histories that is really difficult to decipher and feels that in order to really get a sense of what's being communicated, you'd have to go back and be able to speak to the person who was, um, you know, at the center of that, that oral history. And I think, I guess anytime we're engaging with something that's already out there, it's about how can we engage with it in a way that doesn't involve re-narrativizing it and reframing it and actually um, suggesting that something's going on there that isn't. So hopefully that answers that question in some way. I can see in the question that this is to do with a publicly available um, online resource, exactly. I think. Right. Yeah, yeah. So I think it's great, for example, that it's something that's publicly available. Um, and, and even if it's publicly available, there are always uh, huge ethical questions there. But I would, yeah, I think I'd also say beyond that, the content of what's being discussed in that oral history can have huge implications here. How, you know, what's the subject matter? Um, are people named? Um, you know, what, what issues to do with sensitivity might right. need to be handled as part of that. Right. So even if it's publicly available, maybe even, you know, even in your own response to it, just how, how do you interpret the ethics of the moment? And it might be something for the methodology chapter. I love methodology. Yeah. But um, uh, we have from Ali. Ali said she would love to hear, and uh, Margaret thanks you, by the way. Um, she would love to hear your views about how to ethically research performativity mm -hmm. in the digital space. Um, particularly, she's thinking about your earlier comments and works like you know that of Karen Patel mm -hmm. with Craft, which shows how much digital identity and reality mm -hmm. can be dissonant, how we mm -hmm. perform online versus who we are. Mm -hmm. Just yeah. the conundrum of digital, <laughs> yeah. the digital Absolutely. work. Absolutely, I feel like we could spend another <laughs> Five to ten hours on that alone but I guess maybe an immediate thing is are you choosing to analyze material that is produced by somebody who would regard themselves as a public figure so I think for example I, I would sometimes teach in a methods module and people would do some twitter analysis sometimes making use of tautonomy and I would say there's a huge difference between choosing to analyze the twitter profile of a public figure, whether that's a politician, whether that's a celebrity, right, that's not right. to say there are no ethical issues because they're still people too. But um, there's a huge difference between choosing to analyze material shared by someone who is clearly a public figure um, and, and posts knowingly, and somebody who might view themselves as, as sort of existing in relative obscurity. And again, who could find that if what they're posting ends up in a, in a research context, suddenly them and aspects of who they are in their lives are, are rendered very hyper visible um, and can put them at risk. So it's, it's not that I am saying you can never engage with or look at material that isn't posted by someone who's a public figure, but I, I do think that the ethical considerations are different um, because if someone is posting often from whether it's a blue tick um, or, or sort of an official um, celebrity social media account. Sometimes it's not even that individual posting, it can be a team. It's, you know, it's very different um, and, and it's often a very explicit aspect of marketing and branding activity. But when we are dealing with an individual who, who do, does not take up that sort of space, um, we can't make assumptions about what they do or don't think is gonna happen to what they post. Um, and we need to think about how can, that situation be handled with care and and um, with as much consideration for ethical issues as possible. No, uh, I one of the things that jumps quickly to mind is the issue of time. Um, when I'm thinking of, um, I forget what the U.S. president's account is, but Barack Obama tweeting as president and now on his individual account as Barack Obama. Mm -hmm. Where do it, he's still public, right? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Mm -hmm. He doesn't hold mm -hmm. office. Maybe I just added more confusion. <laughs> no, no, it's great. I, I, think that's, I think it's a great point because stuff can change. And something else that I've spoken about with students is, you know, a post can be public one week and next week it's private. And what if the researcher saved that post and it is now private? 
as a researcher, does the researcher decide they're, they're going to continue to analyze that post that they had access to previously? Or do they decide this person clearly doesn't want that to be private anymore? So I think it's a great point you raise. None of this is static or fixed. It's, it's, it's fluid and shifting. So again, re researchers need to be um, flexible and reflexive and be prepared to make changes even at and what can feel like an inconvenient stage in the research process. Yeah, but, and very much I, what I took from it was also very much is centered on, you have to look at who you, the co context of who are you looking at? Mm -hmm. Prime Minister expects to be analyzed and sifted through, mm -hmm. I might not expect it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, Salome, I'm not, um, one of our students says, do you see real changes in policies and what is happening online in terms of data protection and preventing harassment from social um, media? And does that influence, does this movement influence your research? So I think there are people who know a, a lot more than me about the, the policy side of stuff. So, so I wouldn't want to suggest that I, I feel I'm, I'm an expert in that area, but I would say um, I think there have been some interesting discussions we've seen over this last couple of years, especially to do with online racism, online abuse, online mm. harassment. Something that unnerves me, though, is often the focus is on this idea that online anonymity is the enemy and this assumption that people don't say and do abusive things in person or from online accounts where they're identifiable. Um, and often we also see online anonymity and pseudonymity they can be mixed up and um, there can be confusion surrounding, you know, how can you find out who's behind an account? So I think there've been a lot of discussions. I see a lot of discussions, but whether or not that's going to translate into action is another thing. And I think what's tricky is some of the discussions to do with online safety and online harm. And um, those discussions aren't always inclusive of lots of different experiences of online harm and abuse. They sometimes focus on very few ex experiences and at the exclusion of others. So I think for changes to be effective, they need to cover the experiences of everybody um, and particularly those who are most marginalized um, and most likely to, to face abuse online and otherwise. Right, I, I know we have, I don't want to call names, um, but I know there's an ongoing um, one ar around a recent book and just a different side. I'm sure you've seen that discussion and just the online, you know, who gets to be critique and what's a valid critique, mm. et cetera. Um, that all right i have I'll, I'll take three more questions are there any ethic oh this is interesting are there any ethical implications by analyzing things like online documents and texts that have been released by governments and councils um mm -hmm. for example language use but i suspect this is similar to the celebrity issue um, the yeah i i guess i would just say I'm reluctant to say that there's never ethical issues when dealing with any, I, I just think there are always <laughs> ethical issues of some sort, it's trying to find out what they are. So I think, um, yeah, there are always ethical issues of different sorts. For example, some government documents will, might feature res the responses of different individuals who aren't working um, in an official capacity. So I'm thinking even recently, I was doing some research to do with uh, marketing and brands and social justice and I was looking at documents to do with employees who'd um, taken a case out against a particular organization and whilst I was reading through those publicly available documents I was seeing these experiences are horrific and it must be very difficult perhaps for some of those people um, who whose cases the outcome wasn't in support of them and that information is in the public domain and I was thinking what would it mean to reflect on that as a researcher um, would these people want that information highlighted again? And um, could could that be traumatic for them? Could it result in them, um, you know, dealing with an acrimonious organisation that they once dealt with? So maybe that's an answer to that question. I think any piece of material that is dealt with as a researcher, there are ethical implications, um, and and there's always questions around whose experiences are you learning about from that? And um, do you think they'd be aware of the fact you're doing that? And how might highlighting their experiences in written form or otherwise? help or hinder their lives um, or, or, or neither in some way. Okay, okay. Uh, all right. Oh, um, and Maria posted the EU Digital Services Act. So that might be something for, for you all to look at. The, the link is in the chat. And Becca said, thank you. Um, in one, I, one of the things that I'm struck by was in the ancient days of what was that? Uh, 
2018 when I, I did a qualitative methodology course. And um, one, of, one of the things I talked about was doing political research in, um, on, well, undemocratic countries, so dictatorships, et cetera. And so you don't have the, the same kind of, you know, Vox Pop, YouGov, you don't have any of those kinds of methods. And one of the things they utilize, um, in you talking about me, one of the things they utilize were comics, um, mm. particularly, you know, what kind, how people made fun of their leaders told you a lot about, or what aspect about what they agreed with and what they didn't agree with in a way that there was no other way to capture that. And I feel meme culture, when you see what, you know, the response to um, the very, what is this now, party gate, the very, mm. uh, part, Bojo's party gate and just the, the meme culture of that, you know, um, the response that also gives you an idea or can it, or does it give you an idea of what's going on because of course it's who is on the platform mm -hmm. and and then the distinction between what instagram says and what twitter says mm -hmm. absolutely absolutely yeah actually yes. just th thinking about that as well i'm <laughs> embarking on a research project with a friend and we're speaking about gener gen generational differences that can apply when we're dealing with some platforms and that's not to generalize because i also think it's really unhelpful when there's this idea that there's only people from a particular generation on a certain platform mm -hmm. but a platform like tiktok's one that you know i i'm not personally particularly familiar <laughs> with from a research point of view to an extent and um, but twitter is the space for me so so we're, we're starting to sort of delve into TikTok in different ways and we were just thinking about well, what we're wanting to focus on we know that the the digital discourse on Twitter is is different to digital discourse yeah. on TikTok and and we're mindful of that so we want want to look at it across those platforms and yeah just completely agree with what you're saying yeah. um and then we have another question from Ali here that you know um there is a growing call for more feminist and inclusive approaches. But what is the effect of the platformization mm. of so much knowledge and information mm. on these approaches? Mm. Yeah, thanks very much for that. I think um, one of the many effects is it's tricky because I know with the work I've done the last um, seven years or so, there will be some people I'll speak to who will say, what they do and share online, they want it to be as freely available and accessible as possible. They want um, knowledge to be redistributed and shared. They don't want it to be individually owned. Um, others will say they want to strive for that, but they also think it's important that people are credited and at times compensated as well for their work and labour. So I think that question around the platformization of so much knowledge and communication, it's tricky. In some cases, it can help in terms of making things more available and accessible and sharing across different spaces. But there are lots of issues still to do with who has access to these platforms, these technologies, and also lots of issues to do with who is most likely to, to benefit from this. Um, and, and, you know, in the spirit of collectiveness and sharing, whose work and labour might that depend on the most? And here I'm especially thinking about those who are most marginalised and less likely to be viewed in society as people who are knowledge producers, who are um, authorities and experts in terms of their own life and their own lived experience. Yeah. Um, I know we're getting to 20 to 4 and we kind of did want to um, end earlier. Um, I will open up the floor to a, not, a last question. As we say in Jamaica, the last lick, the last question. Okay, huh? I, I guess I would say this is this is a big one, but it was just like how how is digital discourse connected with offline discourse? Like how are the what are because I I assume that's a spec a spectrum of relationships mm -hmm. rather than one. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you yeah that's how do you even start slicing that Francesca? Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> I think I'm gonna try and keep it brief. I think <laughs> the main thing here, I just always say um the online is you know, the so-called online is always connected to so-called offline. So I always say all experiences are linked to certain material conditions um in embodied lives. Um, and even though we're sometimes dealing with screens and technology, which can create and, and there can be some sense of actual distance. Um, what happens online reflects what happens offline and, and, and vice versa. So I think digital discourse, although it's impacted by the affordances of certain platforms and technologies, that, that can kind of does shape what's going on. And um, ultimately, people don't exist because of technology. And um, although technology 
you know, it, it, it's definitely entangled with their lives and, and who they are. Um, and inter social interaction forms of discourse long predated the development of, of the internet and, and social media as we know it. And I think that's why for me, it's always helpful to come back to what is discourse first? And, um, you know, what is social interaction? What is communication? And remembering that that was never dependent on the sorts of technologies we're dealing with, but those technologies have shaped what's going on and we yeah. need to be conscious of that. Yeah, yeah. That's a great, that's a great note to end on. I'm checking if there are any other, yep. No, I... I, for one, because we had originally said 3.30, so, um, and I see, uh, hi, Ali, man, don't see any more questions. Ali, any final words? My only uh, final words to say thank you so much. That was such an interesting presentation, Francesca. The work is really interesting, and the questions you raised, certainly for the group here, for me as well, and the work that I do, really, really valuable, really important questions and great discussion. I think, I hope I can speak for the people attending who I know many of them are working on research project proposals at the moment. This has given them an awful lot to think about in terms of how they might engage in these kinds of methodologies and some of the questions arising in terms of online kind of what what is kind of, what is ethically appropriate and how that is a continuously evolving space. Um, I'm going to pass over to Kim to say the very final words, but thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Francesca, again, echoing Alice's thanks and, um, and I see a, co a, co a number of thanks in the, in the chat. Thank you for presenting for us. Um, it's, def it's an involving space and especially for us in arts and arts management, cultural policy, creative industries. Um, these are spaces that have traditionally been um, on the vanguard of, of, of technology, like you, you know, anything that helps and, and sh helps to share information, the create cultural and creative industries jump on that. Um, and so it's important for us as we do research, et cetera, to realize that yeah, there are so many, I, I'll end with Yang's own, the, the relationship between the offline world and the online world ethically is a spectrum. And so we have to keep questioning ourselves. And I, I think I'll take from it, I, I should note, Nethography will now be in our um, research methods course next year. <laughs> I just uh, I just want to say a huge thank you um, to you. Yeah, a huge thank you for inviting me to do this today and, and all the work that's gone into making this happen. And everybody who's here as well, and, and do feel free to get in touch with any questions. And I look forward to staying informed about all the brilliant stuff that you're doing too. So thank you very much. Thank you. And with that, we end. Thank you so much, Francesco. Take care. Bye.